Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Aisha Musa, and uh, I'm a research associate in uh, RWTH Aachen, the Institute uh, Autom Automation for Complex Power Systems. Um, I have recently finished my PhD at the beginning of this year. Um, yeah, so today I'm going to talk about frequency control and stability in future electronics driven uh, electrical networks, talking about the challenges and solutions. First, I will give kind of introduction to today's and future electrical networks. Thanks a lot to my colleagues, Professor Joe um, and Professor Maza, that they, they give uh, kind of uh, a coherent knowledge to support uh, like my presentation. So, in today's power systems, um, this is the, this is the, the philosophy that we have here for for like power balance and frequency stabilization regulation. Uh, in today's power systems, uh, the generation uh, are mainly bulk and high concentrated synchronous generator generators. Um, they are totally under control because you you have already the primary uh, energy resource, you, so you have the plan, the schedule for your generation, and so on. Um, they have, since they have a, a huge um, like um, size of the rotating machine, that means they have a high physical inertia, and they have primary power reserve. And these enable them to be responsible for power uh, balance and frequency stabilization. Um, also, the, 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 the structure for the system is that um, the frequency regulation is done mainly from the transmission side, okay? So there is no role for the passive distribution network. Furthermore, the current system is uh, characterized with the slower uh, system dynamics. That's due to the reason uh, that it is linked and coupled, the overall system is linked and coupled with the existing synchronous generators, which have the mechanical movement, uh, which in turn have this slower dynamics, resulting in slower dynamics. And also the structure for the system is that you have a unidirectional power flow from transmission distribution networks. However, in future, <coughs> the, the story will be totally different. So, um, for the first, from uh, moving from the bulk concentrated to a more distributed renewable generation units, and um, this will result in um, the challenge of unpredictable generations. Um, also, this will lead to a very low or near zero uh, physical inertia and the absence of the power reserve. Uh, I want you to emphasize this out about this uh, inertia. Within reserve, we have two scenarios. One scenario focusing on the um, solutions for renewables up to 100%, considering hydro, because hydro from the system dynamics point of view, it's like more or less like the synchronous generator. So we have some colleagues, some partners uh, also working on this, uh, considering like one of the European countries like Romania, uh, they have more hydro. More hydro means you still have synchronous machines, so you still have some uh, like players who can support the stability of the system. While, so these having inertia, so they will have hyperinflation of solar and wind, but they will still have physical inertia. While in other countries like Germany, they almost don't have hydro in the future. So they will rely more mainly on solar and wind. And hence, uh, we're expecting that almost negligible or very low, let's say, uh, uh, physical inertia. At the same time, the renewables are always operating at maximum power points, so there is no power reserve at the moment. There are some futuristic, very far futuristic trends talking about the generation shedding, whatever, but at the moment and the near future, there is no power reserve for the, from the renewables. Um, also, this leads to posing a challenge to frequency stability of the system. So um, I'm talking about the, the future electric networks challenges and possibilities or like advantages and disadvantages. Um, coming back to the frequency regulation, it's expected to be done in a coordination between the TSO and DSO because the transmission and distribution networks. Because um, at the end, there will be very high and fast 
transition for renewable uh, integration in the solution systems more yeah, likely uh, more than the, faster than the transmission. So the distribution will be playing as an active role to participate in frequency stability. The system will um, can be characterized with a higher system dynamics, and that's due to the higher deployment of the protronics. You know, protronics they have very higher uh, fast dynamics, and there is no mechanical motion. There is no synchronous machines they, which are displaced with the protronics. So this will lead to slower, faster system and higher system dynamics. Um, also, instead of unidirectional. There's a, there will be a bi-directional power flow from to transmit the CVG networks. So we can see from here that there are some uh, possibilities to invest, okay? And there are some challenges, okay? So to adapt transition towards future smart grids, so we should need a new technologies and conceptual solutions. There are different trends, um, okay, to, to reach towards smart grids. Um, yeah, with the reserve, we are conducting different activities, research activities. Obviously, there will be high penetration of renewables. That's one of the main like uh, characteristics of future smart grids, future smart and sustainable, uh, like say, grids. And because of the existence of unpredictable and violated generation from the renewables, there will be a very active role of these storage systems, which will play an active role in um, shaving the renewable and frequency regulation, stability, and so on, power quality, and so on. Also, um, considering the revolution of the offshore wind farms and the increasing interest in the international power exchange, so there will be a very high uh, um, like interest and significant role for HVDC systems, okay? And that will be deployed uh, in the future uh, European transmission network. I will explain this later. Furthermore, the um, consumers will move from the consumer to prosumers, so there will be also a kind of active player to, to negotiate, talk to the grid, provide their support. Um, the HF vehicles, which are more or less kind of storage from the grid point of view. Um, virtual power plants, aggregators, they will be participating in the, in the energy balance and market, balancing market. Um, demand side management, to coordinate and manage the activities for the, the for, for the demand side, for the consumers, uh, balancing market that will have a new and active uh, roles. And also, as my colleague Professor Maza also said, there will be a coordinated framework between DSO and TSO for the frequency regulation. Due to the time limit here, I will explain and consider part of these activities. So, um, Within this presentation, I will give these three uh, proposed um, uh, new solutions. Starting with the first one. Okay, so um, as I've mentioned, uh, to, to realize the future transition towards uh, up to 100 petrol renewables, there is no way that we can achieve that without uh, giving a significant role uh, to the storages. And that's why there are different trends now investigating the different storage technologies about the uh, power ratings, the timing, and so on, the location, the sizing. Um, uh, they will they will be um, used in different applications, as you can see here. Uh, here I will present the main role for them to be used for the frequency regulation, like to provide kind of the energy response that is absent in the electronics based generation and that was exist classically in the synchronous generators. So um, in this approach, what I want to show that <laughs> you might have one country, they have some pl planning for the future generation, so they will uh, plan for a specific level of renewable penetration. But within this scenario, uh, have, we have done here uh, like a, a study to develop an algorithm that will be studying and calculating the limits of the uh, renewable energy penetration level for a specific system that make uh, a guaranteed secure and stable integration so without sacrificing the stability of the system so for this i have considered this analytical model this is the generic analytical model and this is the first um, algorithm um, so as you can see here so we have a system we can put the input uh, for the information for the system, 
And then we can put the contingencies, so within a specific, for example, 10% of renewables, and then give the input system parameters, make the contingency, and see the two matrices for the frequency, which are the Rokov and the Fnader. So if the, the limit is violated, so the last step, so not this one, the, the previous penetration level is the maximum secure penetration level. If it's not, so there will be more penetration than renewables. So that's the logic for this uh, algorithm. And then the same algorithm is used for the IEEE uh, England uh, power system. Because uh, when we apply the, the, uh, the contingency here, we can see, and this is the analytical calculated dynamic parameters for the system. The time time constant, uh, root over the F number. And the scenario is by tripping this generator. And here, as you can see, with more penetration of renewables, the time constant tan is decreasing while the Rukov is increasing, okay? So our aim usually that we need to limit, okay, to reduce the Rukov, okay? And that's why the storage will come and play this important role. So here, for the storage, let's say that we have a specific amount of renewables and that might cause uh, like a instability problems, frequency instability problems. So what we can do, how we can, with this algorithm, how we can size the storage that we have within the network that we can guarantee stable integration of renewables. So to clear doing, also given the, the existing renewables, given the specific size for the storage, and then define the system parameter the same as before, may apply the contingency and then calculate the rope of an F -nother. If they are violated, so we increase the sizing. If it's not so, this is the maximum sizing, let's say the optimal sizing for the storage. And we can see here, so um, as we can see here, it's a high quality graph, that's why it's a bit delay here to the slides. As you can see here, so with the increase um, installation for the storages, we have a reduction in the rook of an increase in the time constant. And that's, that's what we want to achieve to have more stable integration. And then we come here to a simulation model to validate the analytical and the simulation model and use this a simplified system and we applied okay, the same disturbance before and after adding the renewables. And you can see the differences in the Rukov and Fnader and also the time, uh, the, time, the time constant. So we can see here how the renewables are affecting the frequency stability here. And then um, just also showing the analytical and the graphically calculated dynamic parameters. Um, for uh, the graph, and these are the, the table. And then we will, okay, next step, we are putting storage here to improve the, the system stability, frequency stability. And we can see how, uh, here that with the storage, okay, um, and we can see the, the, the analytically and the graphical calculated, so the simulation analytical model, we have almost the same results. So, so they have. Uh, we try to do this to validate the system and the algorithm that we have developed. So they have almost the same results, okay? That's the first one that was the storage in the future electrical networks. The second one is um, we developed a concept to provide a new form of um, cycle generated emulation. As you have heard yesterday from uh, two days before from Professor David Ray, from Professor Mondial, well, um, since we are not having the cyclone generator in the future, so why do we need, uh, okay, so anyway, before that, the cyclone generators, they have advantages and disadvantages. So, uh, since you have heard a lot about this, uh, can I ask what are the advantages and disadvantages of the cyclone generators from the frequency stability point of view? So what are the advantages, let's say? Okay, and primary reserve, power reserves, okay? And what are the disadvantages that, okay, disadvantages now? Slow response. Okay. Okay, and? So then you have costly, you know, generation. So we need to have kind of free, you know, uh, primary resource for the generation. So um, here, 
in order to have the transition towards future systems with keeping the, the same theme of today's power systems from the system dynamic point of view. That's why <coughs> we proposed the solution, there's a, a recently proposed solution of emulating the second generator, okay? So, um, we have Poetronics, thanks a lot to the Poetronics uh, to exploit their smarts, freedom of controllability to achieve whatever we want, okay? So we will have Poetronics. And then, since the second generators have some disadvantages, so there is no sense to emulate completely the same behavior, okay? Considering their disadvantages. So there is a need to, uh, like, to de develop and define a new form, a new concept that will have uh, an enhanced um, like emulation, enhanced behavior. And that's what I want to present here. So um, first, let's talk about the, in general, energy emulation schemes. So um, two schemes are like proposed in the literature. The first one is the virtual sign point generator. It is um, based on DQ control, DQ reference frame control, and using the um, the active power droop frequency control here, the same as the droop control that has been defined by Professor Thomas in the classical stacker generators. That's why here all the um, all the mechanical dynamics of the classical stacker generator are virtually implemented and introduced here. Okay, so yeah, so that's. That's what has, has been like proposed in the literature. Um, it's implemented based on the classical representation of the swing equation, okay? Um, and it's considered a power and control part. And this is the detailed control structure for the system. So it has like the virtual energy and power control, IC voltage control, and the inner and going to the modulation. For the virtual energy, we have this control, which is based on active uh, power frequency for drew control. The second one is called synchro inverter. It's also uh, one of the synchro generator emulation schemes. So um, it's based on ABC reference frame. Um, as you can see, using also the same representation for the synchro generator. Uh, having this as the uh, power frequency through the control, through control. And here's the um, reactive power voltage control. And here, giving the calculation and same to the um, modulation. So um, that one is the generic synchro inverter. One point is interesting that if we come back to this, okay, the virtual synchro generator, it's using BLM, okay? While the new one, the synchro inverter has the futures of self-synchronized, which is more realistic emulation of synchro generator. Because synchro generator does not have a PLM, so with the synchro inverter, we have more closer uh, realistic emulation. And how will be the, uh, the self-synchronized? So we have two additional loops here, as you can see. Um, these loops are used for the self-synchronization. This one will start up the converter, build up the voltage, and there will be kind of a fastidious current from this virtual impedance, let's say. And they'll be uh, checking this voltage, the generated, okay? The generated sorry from here and the grid. So when it is uh, like when it is um, uh, when the voltage generated will be matching the grid generate uh, voltage uh, like uh, values, and then this will be resulting in zero, and then this will be switched to the grid connected. Okay, and the same will be from the above. From the above, the frequency will be always checked with the with the normal frequency. So the omega, let's say, here, and when it is matched, so there is there will be zero here. If there will be uh, any difference, then will be corrected via PI till reaching matching the nominal frequency, and then this will be grid connected. And this factor inverter could have a different operating modes. Could be the grid feeding, in a way. With this, it's always just delivering the power, regardless if you have frequency uh, uh, disturbances. And here, also, this is open for the providing the droop reactive power voltage um, support. So this is open, just delivering the, the, the power. This is the grid support in which we have a droop reactive power voltage control and a droop active power frequency control. Okay? These are the, the, the status for these switches. 
So I just want to show one uh, one slide for the results, showing that this the, how would be the startup for the for the synchron inverter. So the, here will be energized, okay, checking the voltage and the current, and here will be matching with the grid. They will be connected here, so A will be grid connection time. So for the grid connection, we have we don't have any you know oscillations and so on. And then after that, there will be a PRF increase, let's say, before the demand. And you can see here, I just I just show here one example, which is the grid feeding. Grid feeding is that this is the frequency for the grid. So the, uh, the uh, um, okay, so one of them would be is for the grid. And then the other one is the following for the converter. So the synchro inverter following the grid of frequency does not provide any power support. And that's why you can see here, even the power is continuously fed by the synchro inverter. So here is the difference between the virtual cycle generator and the synchro inverter. So the, for example, uh, the first based on DQ, the other ABC uh, requirements, PLL, this one, this one has two schemes. One scheme for the synchro inverter that used the PLL only in the startup, okay, which is not considered here. And the, the other one, which is the, the latest version that I have presented now, it is the self-synchronized synchro inverter, okay? And the operation modes here. So, um, yeah, to enhance the, the behavior for the synchro inverter and the virtual synchro generator as well, we introduced this concept, which is called the linear swing dynamics. You heard a lot about this from Professor Monty, Professor Reyes, okay, um, before. Um, basically, this concept would be introduced in the renewable type converters and uh, it will define, it will achieve power angle linear characteristics. So this is the schematic and this is analytical results. Okay, so this is the classical nonlinear swing equation. And here the blue one is the new, okay, with the new concept. Um, there are different approaches to, re to realize and achieve the LSD concept. Here I'm showing the concept uh, that's based on the AC voltage um, control. So within the the permitted AC voltage tolerance, we are able to exploit and invest this tolerance, which is which is 10 percent in the distribution systems and five percent in the transmission systems, to achieve the LSD characteristics. And the as you can see here, the LSD control is introduced within the inertia emulation control. So the, the futures of the uh, of the LSD is that at the end we will achieve linear and uniform uh, system swing dynamics. Okay, when you have a linear, for example, track, first you will easily predict what is the status, what is the state for the next steps. Okay, and then you will have more coherent uh, frequency regulation control. Okay, and more um, uh, easiest way to assess the stability of the system, okay? So that, that, that's, that's the advantage of the, of the linear, okay, uh, term. And here's the derivation. Started with the, we've started from the single machine infinite bus to develop the concept, starting from this the power, uh, power, uh, power anchor formula, and then actually exploiting this specific, uh, like, uh, con uh, proper IC voltage control we can achieve um, within these two formulas, the LSD. So we can achieve the linear power angle characteristics. Here is the, is the um, integration of the LSD in the synchro inverter. So these are the main uh, equations for the synchro inverter. They were shown already before. And here we can see that we remove the active power control because basically one of the features of the, of the LSD is that it's implicitly regulate the active reactive power, sorry, reactive power, by by controlling the AC voltage. Because you know, mainly why do we need uh, why do we need reactive power control at the end to have you know voltage regulation? So this is implicitly related to that because it's it's controlling the AC voltage for a different operating conditions. And that's why we remove this the reactive power control loop from here. And we add this uh, this formulation that's related to the LSD resulting to this schema, and you can see here that this is this is the, uh, the LSD control loop that's given the updated VREF 
for every different operating conditions. And this is the stability proof. And we can see that from the stability condition, the system at the end is not dependent, the system stability is not dependent on delta or any other uh, like variable dynamics, uh, st uh, like st state, let's say the system. We have two constant coefficients, the damping and the, the, the inertial constant, okay? So we can guarantee that here uh, we can assess this system stability to be independent, okay? The system stability to be independent uh, from the operating condition, okay? If we have here, the t in the, within this term, we have delta, so we will have the stability is changed, the stability margin, stability as a, like assessment will be changed for every different operating condition. While here, we can guarantee that it's independent from any operating condition. And these are the results. And yeah, I've run different like uh, loading level for the power demand, okay? And this is the frequency and this is the voltage. So it is a bit varying to achieve this linear characteristics. So well, that's all for the um, for the uh, inertia emulation scheme. Coming back to the HVDC systems. Um, yeah, so for HVDC systems, according to the um, NTSOE 10 years network development plan for 2030, there will be more than 143 projects of HVDC systems in which there will be part in operation part under construction and part will be commissioned. So <coughs> there will be very high integration and installation for HVDC systems in the futuristic European transmission networks, as you can see here. And that's why there's increasing interest to exploit the futures and advantages of the HVDC systems to provide more, um, more intelligent way and more adaptive way of frequency support as a facility service. Because um, in the latest recommendation of the NGSO, the HVDC systems are expected to participate in strengthening the existing AC systems. However, this is not explicitly defined for the future very low energy systems or protronics driven systems, in which here we are defining and proposing new solutions for that. So there are many projects. These are an example for these projects. Um, so um, I just want to highlight that at the end, in the future, there will be different European countries will be interconnected via HVDC systems. There will be islands, small, large grids with a different transition uh, levels to the, towards the renewables. Some may have hydro renewables more, some may have mainly uh, solar and wind. So this will result first in the low energy, syst low energy systems in overall Europe, because all are like the train for solar and wind. Um, and there will be different, there will be a collection of different weak and stiff AC grids because there will be different sizes of the AC, of the AC grids here. There will be different characteristics, different technical constraints. Um, yeah. So also the, the the variation of the surplus power and demand for each AC grid. For example, some some for example European, European countries might have a 20 day very high generation for renewables. On the other hand, some other countries that may have uh, power, sh I don't want to say power shortage, but a peak demand. So in this case, in this case, the one with the surplus power is more available to support the neighbor countries with power than the country that's working, like what Professor uh, Thomas said, um, we have the AGC that's reaching 100 percentage, okay, to using all the primary power reserves, okay? So for this, we need to have Okay, so the classical way for for HVDC support, um, role in frequency stabilization is that there will be a frequency drip control implemented in the HVDC converter stations, which are connected to the AC grids, to the onshore AC grids. And the classic and the well-known frequency control scheme is that in case of a disturbance in one grid, so all the HVDC connected to AC grids will participate to provide a specific amount of active power to support the disturbed AC grid, okay? The point is that so far the participation is fixed. So all the schemes proposed in the literature, also the recent literature, they are based on the fixed participation from all the AC grids. However, this doesn't work in the future systems because at the end of the future, 
um, the weak and island small side icy grid is not really willing to participate uh, with uh, like a large amount of active power comparing with a stiff AC grid with more like renewables or more power reserve or higher energy and so on. So there's a need for, let's say, kind of an adaptive and intelligent frequency control. And the aim is that to, to think globally, so look at all the characteristics for the HPTC connected AC grids and act locally to provide frequency support without compromising the frequency stability of the local AC grid. Furthermore, as you have seen, um, there will be new solutions for the, uh, for the new renewable type converters, which are based on uh, cyclone generator emulation. And what we have discussed before is that the solutions which are located uh, the solutions for the converters which are located in the onshore. So let's say the onshore renewables, okay? Also, we, we defined the LSD concept that's introduced in the also um, in the grid tight onshore renewables. So to have like to achieve the objectives in a systematic way, we have mainly all the power source we will have it either from the onshore or from the HVDC connected, either offshore renewables or another country. So we will have the main power source from these sources, okay? So from the wind and solar, the renewable that will be onshore and the HVDC side that could be either from offshore renewables or from other country. So it makes sense that we can achieve the same for this converter to achieve a systematic level, you know? And yeah, for this, we propose the LSD-based virtual synchronous generator for the grid-type HVDC converters. And the aim is that to define a new role and behavior for the HVDC systems in providing the um, frequency support based on LSD concept. So starting for the, with the first one, um, basically, this is the classical uh, control. So it's using the uh, group control from here, this is the frequency, and this is the active power. So the frequency, if there's a deviation frequency, would be multiplied by this true coefficient, and given there's an additional amount of power, okay, and from the power from, from the HVDC, MTDC, and then to provide the additional power, okay? So that is, that is the classical one. And then we have discussed that there's a need for more adaptive, okay, uh, control to consider different characteristics of the networks. And that's why we propose this one, the agent-based um, control. And basically this one, for every, for every grid side HVDC converter, there will be this frequency control, which will include an agent. So for every grid side HVDC converter, there will be an agent. This agent will be responsible to provide the frequency support to the respective AC grid. Here, every agent has two modes has either the requester mode in which the respective AC grid will be disturbed. So if the respective AC grid will be disturbed, so logically this grid will request for power from either from the other AC grid, or the supporter, in which it will receive that the message that that grid, that guy is uh, disturbed, so there is a need for support. And these are the two matrices for the <coughs> For, to, this, to the, like, define and decide if the, agent, if, if the agent is in the requester mode or the supporter mode. I've used these two terms as two conditions. Who can tell me why I used these two conditions? So this is the frequency deviation and this is the Rokov. So why not we can just use the frequency deviation as a measure to see if this grid is supporting or requesting, if this is disturbed or not disturbed. So why not I just used Rokov, or why not I just used the, the frequency deviation? Let's say the F nagar, let's say. Why I used both of them? Okay. Um, because simply, when one grid to, will participate in a specific amount of power, it will be disturbed, yes? And this will result in a frequency deviation. Yes? So, 
we don't want to trigger the requester mode for the two agents. So uh, we don't want to request, we don't want to trigger the requester mode for this for the supporting grid. Okay, so that's why we propose these two. We define these two conditions. These two conditions show that the supporter grid might, might participate with the active power, okay? But it will definitely not reach the raw complement. It might, the worst case, it might reach, it might have a frequency deviation, but will not reach the raw complement, okay? And that's why we define these two, just to distinguish with like mistriggering the requester and the supporter. And then here, the, here is the logic. The logic is that this is the root coefficient, and it is it is this is the uh, the curve, and this is different differently selected based on the grid stiffness. Okay, so this shows that we have adaptive droop control. Okay, and this this value will be moving here based on the technical characteristics of the AC grid at that time. So. Starting with the requester, so the requester will like have to fulfill will fulfill these two conditions: the rook of uh, hitting the rook of limit and the frequency deviation delta f, and then we'll estimate the power imbalance, how much power it should get, okay? And then seeing the power requests. So this is the requester that belongs to that grid. Check the frequency disturbance. Estimate the corresponding power uh, support that should be provided from others, then send message requests to all HDDC connected AC grids. So all will be receiving this message. Coming to the supporter, the supporter will receive the message, and also it has different conditions, okay, to fulfill and participate with this, uh, with the power. So it's checking first the instantaneous critical power demand, okay, to see if it has a critical power demand, so there's a priority to fulfill that demand, okay, and then provide how much power they have, okay? And also checking the prediction of the resulting frequency deviation, because the weak AC grids, if they can, if they will participate with high amount of power, they might like, um, they might pose a challenge or pose like critical uh, situation for instability in the frequency, okay? So that's why in, in advance they check and predict the frequency deviation that will be in case that this grid will participate with this power. And then, yeah, as I mentioned, for the critical demand. And then run the optimization. So for example, this is the, the critical demand. And as we can see here that this is the instantaneous power demand, the power supply. And this is the like probabilistic profile. And when, is, when there is a, a support from this AC grid, this will be shifted to here. So this agent will try to optimize, minimize this uh, gap, okay? And this is the test system in which we have five, five AC grids interconnected via HVDC system to receive the offshore wind power. And the five AC grids have a different characteristics. As you can see, different inertial damping, and even we consider might have a different um, let's say, let's say grid codes, but different standards for the frequency deviation limits. Okay, and it's compared with the with the well-known classical frequency drop control. And we propose, we defined here that we have five AC grids. Two are weak, three and four are weak AC grids, and one um, so three and four weak, one, two, five are stiff AC grids. And we run test scenarios. And the test scenario here, consider that there's a loss of generation in AC grid one. And as you can see here is that with the proposed control, so the black one is the proposed and the, and the other one is the uh, classical. As you can see is that from the results, we can um, like conclude that the burden for the frequency support is taken mainly from the stiff AC grids, okay? So these are the uh, these are the labels for the AC grids. For example, we can uh, come to the AC grid three, which is the weak AC grid. So we can see that with the classical, it has more deviation. This is the frequency for the AC grid three, and with the proposed, but, uh, part of this power it's taken it's like saved for this grid and taken from other stiff AC grids, resulting in, in the frequency stability enhancement of the AC grid three. So this is the classical, and this is with the proposed one, okay? Because 
At the end, if you take more power from stiff AC grid, it will result in less frequency deviation if you take this power from the weak AC grid. Okay? So that's the logic. And the same for AC grid 4. If you see the AC grid 4, so um, this is um, the, okay, so th this is the one the the uh, this is the one um, that we have in the, the classical. Um, it's not shown, really shown here, and that is the, with the proposed so in, enhanced stability frequency profile. And then we can observe that there is no significant deviation in the DC voltage uh, profile with choosing adaptive group coefficients. Okay. And that's why I've shown only once the DC voltage profile here, just to show that there is no changes when we have this new control compared with the classical control. Another scenario, um, one of the agents was like uh, kind of having a failure. So there's a failure in one agent, okay? And in case of failure in one agent, basically if you come back to, the, um, to this structure, if there's a failure in one agent, that means the control will be using the classical way, okay? So we'll come back to the same classical way. And the, that's why you see here, if there's an agent two failure that belongs to AC grid two, you can see still we have an enhancement, particularly in the disturbed AC grids and AC grid and the weak AC grids, while. The agent two, so the AC grid two will have the same. Um, okay, so we'll have less performance now because the AC AC grid two, the agent belong to AC grid two, will not have this adaptive selection of frequency group, and that's why you result to this. And also, we compare it with the with the classical. We still have the improvements. And this is a table. Um, given the conclusions for the comparison. And we can observe that, um, yeah, from the test scenarios, we conclude that the proposed um, control achieve a systematic frequency stability enhancement, particularly in the <coughs> disturbed and weak AC grids. So this is the comparison. This is Rukov and uh, F. Nader for the classical, and this is for the proposed, considering the agent failure and yeah, normal operation. So that's the first one. The second one is the uh, using the same concept of the LSD uh, with the synchronous generator emulation to be implemented in the grid side HPDC converter. And a simple question. So why do we need now to have the synchronous generator emulation in the grid side HPDC converter? Because before, the people, I mean, the researcher were saying that the advantage of HVDC grid is that it is decoupling two AC networks. So if there is disturbance in one AC network, it will not affect the other because we have a HVDC. It's more or less, it depends on the disturbance. But the HVDC is it's called kind of firewall. That was like, it's referring before to HVDC system. Now, why do we need to to enable HVDC converters to behave like the second generator. By the way, enable the HVDC converter to emulate the second generator means that we are moving the HVDC converter behavior from the passive to active. Active means it will be responsive to any change in the AC grid. Okay? So why do we need to, to make this one? Before they say, okay, it's better that it's not responsive to the AC grid. So these are, for example, okay. So this is AC1, let's say. This is AC2, and this is HVDC. And this is uh, like voltage source converter two, voltage source converter one. Before, this was just providing the power, which is the solid role of the HVDC systems to, to deliver the power over long distances. So this was just delivering the power, so it's not kind of responding to any changes in the system frequency, let's say, okay? 
So if there's any, not always, if there are some disturbance in this side, would not affect this secret because both are decoupled via HBDC system. Now, if we implement here the second generator emulation, we will have more or less that two area connected system, connected system within, let's say, HVAC, let's say, because at the end, at the end, these will be coupled now, and if there's any any changes or like disturbances, the HVDC converter converters will respond. So, um, okay. From one side, we will lose this future, but from the other side, we will strengthen the synchronization of the European transmission networks at the end, because we will have different countries. They are decoupled. Yes, for for example, we have an uh, the Irish grid. Irish grid. Always they say it's kind of island with grid and so on because it has less connection. They have now future planning for the HVDC connections, but because they don't have a stiff and strong connections, so um, yeah, so that's why they need this solution. So they need this. They, so they need to have kind of more strengthening the synchronization and like the the exchange in the support among the AC grids. So that's why we need to have this in the HVDC converters and not only in the onshore. Uh, renewable type converters. So coming back to this, we use the same development for the LSD concept, and from this side we had HVDC converter. Before before we had renewables in the onshore, and now we have HVDC converter using the same concept. And then yeah, I'm just showing here the two channel simplified system just to give you a clear picture for this. For the um, yeah, this one could be renew could be renewables offshore wind farm. Or it could be another AC grid, okay? Because at the end in the North Sea we have a bulk offshore wind, so this might have the two scenarios: either we have offshore renewables or another country. So, um, in case of the offshore renewables, the concept will be implemented here, okay? Because at the end we need to provide the frequency support to the grids. Okay, yeah, we are more caring that we just re we receive stable uh, power from the offshore wind farms uh, and so on. So we are having the priority more on the onshore AC grids. So for this thing, that's why in considering the offshore wind farms, it's implemented only here. Yeah, so that's why uh, the first I would show for the grid side converter, and then we'll show you what's the control of the offshore wind farm. So for this one, um, this is the this is the um, let's, let me just think about this is the control structure, okay, for the HVDC, the operation control structure, and then we use this one to enable second generator emulation, and then we introduce the LSD concept, okay, to have um, LSD based virtual second generator, and then at the end to provide um, frequency support based on this LSD concept. And this is the control loop for the LSD. While for the wind farm side, the converter is the classical control using just active reactive power control. So there is, yeah, there is, there is no like, like there is no valuable sense or reason to, to introduce the LSD here. It's more on the good side. If you have two AC grids, we will definitely define this concept in the two sides. And these are the results. Um, also considering different loadings, so different loadings in the AC grid, and these are the power delivered from the offshore wind farm. So we have different power loading levels, um, and this is the frequency, and then we can see that this is the AC voltage changing. As we have seen before, this relying this concept uh, is depending on uh, the AC voltage tolerance. However, we are still within the limit, okay? So this is the limit. And um, this is the demand this is the change in the angle. This is the virtual angle, okay? That's implemented in the converter. And this is the VDC profile, which is still within the limits according to the NTSOE standards percentage uh, tolerance in the DC voltage profile. And this is the, the linear swing dynamics uh, results and the, like the futures. And you can see here that, yeah, um, the red one is the sinusoidal classical one. The uh, green is the identical the line and the blue one is the, the actual response for the system. As we can see that we guarantee, we guarantee that we have, um, we have 
the linear power angle characteristics in the steady state, as you can see here. And then in the intermediate transients, we have some oscill intermediate oscillations. These oscillations can be tackled by further tuning or optimization or optimizing the control parameters. Okay? And as you can see here that um, the red one represents the classical synchronous generator, as well as representing the same behavior for the, ver the, for the classical virtual synchronous generator. Because the classical virtual synchronous generator, or the classical synchronous generator as well, they use the classical way of the same equation, which results at the end to the nonlinear you know, swing dynamics. Yeah. I'm leaving 10 minutes yeah, for your comments, questions. Mm -hmm.